Hello there, and welcome back to the introduction to English linguistics. In this video, I'd like to get started on a new topic, namely sociolinguistics. What is sociolinguistics? It's the study of language in society, and more specifically, we can say that it is the study of variation in language. What's variation in language? Let me give you a very simple example, namely the word secretary. When you overhear a conversation of people talking about secretaries, uh, you will find that they pronounce the word secretary in slightly different ways. For instance, they might say secretary, they might say secretary with a final E that's a little higher, or they might adopt the trisyllabic pronunciation like secretary. Sociolinguists are interested in this kind of variation. They're asking, who are the people that use one pronunciation rather than another? And uh, to the extent that we have people uh, that switch back and forth between several pronunciations, what are the situations in which they choose one pronunciation rather than another one? Why is this important? Why should we bother analyzing this kind of variation? Well, if you think of it, the way you talk, the pronunciations, the word choices that you make, your grammar, all of that says something about who you are as a person, your social identity. It's kind of like your clothes, the friends that you hang out with, the job that you're doing. Uh, but language, in a way, is even more fundamental. Um, there are strong social beliefs and attitudes associated with certain ways of speaking. People judge other people on the basis of how they talk. And uh, these attitudes are very real. Yeah? But it's important, that, uh, it's important to remember that these are socially constructed norms. They're not objective facts about language itself. People may be very critical about a dialect that they're hearing, but that doesn't mean that this dialect is somehow deficient in an objective way. So I've used the term dialect, and um, because dialects are, well, dialect is a term that is charged with so many ideas that are not actually true, I would like us to avoid this term in this class and talk about varieties of language instead. So dialects, you can think as varieties of language that are characteristic of certain groups of speakers. So we have geographically defined groups, so there we could talk of regional dialects, but people also talk alike uh, when they share certain social factors. And there we might talk of social dialects or sociolects. So people talk differently depending on their socioeconomic class, their ethnicity, their gender, their age, or even their sexual orientation. Right, bottom line is people talk differently, either because they live in different areas or because they share different social characteristics. And so there's variation in language. But not only is there variation between different speakers, but also within you as an individual, there is variation. There are certain idiolects, varieties of language within a single speaker. And this is something we could call your linguistic repertoire. As an individual, you have command of several varieties of language. These might be different languages altogether, and in all likelihood you're capable of speaking two or more different languages. Um, you're probably also capable of using several dialects of the same language. Um, maybe the dialect of the region in which you grew up, and then a standard variety that is spoken more widely in the country. And then even within the same dialect, there is variation going on. Variation in terms of style and register. <clears throat> So what's style? Um, your language variety shifts with the situation in which you find yourself. So um, changes in situational context, whether you're talking to your mom or your friends or your professor or a complete stranger asking for directions, um, you talk a little differently. The things that come out of your mouth sound a little differently. This is something that all speakers do. There are no single style speakers. Everybody shifts according to the situation. Here are some of the things that shift by uh, style. Uh, people style shift, for instance, by adjusting their pronunciation. 
they choose a full form like you would have or a more contracted form heater uh, they use running or running depending on the different context depending on who they're with uh, they choose different words I can phrase something very formally or very informally I can say something very politely or very impolitely um, and I also adapt my grammar to different situations right now I'm in a situation I'm lecturing to you guys so my sentences tend to be a little longer and more complex if we meet up later for a beer my sentences will become increasingly shorter until I only say single word utterances like good or phrases like more beer things like that okay I promised a number of myths about dialects so dialect is a term that is used quite a lot in public discussions about language and it's not really clear what people mean by it but a lot of ideas that circulate about dialects are clearly and demonstrably wrong for instance it's a myth that a dialect is always what somebody else speaks uh, people are convinced that they themselves speak the language proper and other people speak dialects well the fact of the matter is that everybody who speaks a language speaks a certain variety of that language. You can't escape that. Everybody speaks a certain variety of a language. <clears throat> but then people come around and say, well, you know, listen to my speech. You can't notice any features of, of dialectal influence there. Well, it's a myth that dialects always have highly noticeable features that set them apart. Some dialects certainly do. They have very recognizable features that catch a lot of attention and the speakers usually catch a lot of flack for that but the status of a dialect is really unrelated to public commentary about it or the fact whether its features are really recognizable as such then uh, it's a myth that dialects are spoken by socially disfavored groups certainly socially disfavored groups are easy targets always uh, and all the more so if they speak a dialect that's easily recognizable as such. However, the fact of the matter is that there are socially favored dialects as well as socially disfavored dialects. <clears throat> so some varieties carry a whole lot of what I will later describe as overt prestige. <clears throat> then, another myth is that dialects reflect failure to speak correctly. Dialect speakers, they just can't get their grammar right. No, that's not the case. Dialects are every bit as grammatical as other varieties of language. So dialects are acquired by adopting the speech features of other speakers, the speakers that you find yourself surrounded with. And uh, it's not that you acquire a dialect by failing to learn standard, a standard variety of a language. Then, uh, a really persistent myth is that dialects have no systematicity, that they're just random deviations from standard speech. That's not the case. So, um, I can tell you a little story here. Uh, a physicist colleague of mine once approached me and said, Martin, dialects, they are like simplified grammars, right? Uh, some complexity is deteriorated, some rules are lost, and uh, it's, it's all just a bit more random. That's what dialects are, right? And I told him, mm, no. That's not at all what dialects are. Uh, dialects are every bit as systematic and regular as your standard variety of a language. Um, and uh, there's nothing random in dialects. Another myth. Uh, dialects inherently carry negative social connotations. That's not really true. Uh, the social value of a dialect is derived from the social evaluation of its speakers. So if a dialect has a bad reputation, in all likelihood that's because there is something going on in the region uh, that makes these people have a certain reputation and the language just you know, uh, is blamed for that. Then a last myth is that dialects are deviations from the standard which represents the correct form of a language, how a language has always been and how it needs to be preserved. That is completely wrong. Um, the standard, first of all, is also a dialect, one that happened to be chosen as the standard by historical accident. And then um, the standard is not how things have always been. It's rather, that's something very recent. The dialect is 
whole language has been for a very long time. And the standard is really just a deviation from the dialect on which it is based. So this myth has it completely upside down. Dialects are basic. Standard is an artificial and derived thing that is, yeah, uh, has less, fewer historical roots than dialects. Okay, I just had to get that off my chest. We can now move on to more productive matters and talk about ways in which dialects can differ. There are certain features, uh, namely pronunciation, vocabulary, grammar, and also conversational practices, how you open or close a conversation, for instance. So I'll go through these uh, one by one. Here are some pronunciation differences. Um, the guy that you see there in the uh, pink what is that even? It's not a pair of pants. It's more of a cloth, really. Okay, the guy there, his name is either God or God or Gad, depending on where you live. The yellowy stuff that you see at the bottom of the slide there, it's called butter or ba'a or butter. Or if you live in New Delhi, you might also call it baka. Right, pronunciation variation. Let me talk a bit about pronunciation differences in British English, uh, traditional dialects in the British Isles. Um, they pronounce words like son or bus or mother in different ways. What you see in this first map here is that speakers in the, in the south, they tend to say son or bus, and speakers in the north, they tend to say sun or bus. And I brought a little sound clip here. I hope you can hear it all right. I'll make it loud. The speaker says, I'm lucky. I mean, I'm lucky. I mean, I'm lucky. Okay, what it comes out as is, I mean, I'm lucky. Yeah, so we can say, uh, we can be pretty sure that the speaker lives up here in the north. Uh, the second map here shows the pronunciation of the vowel in last, dance, or path. Okay, so in the south there are islands where people say last or dance or path. Then uh, some people say last, and some people say last. <clears throat> Let's say what what this speaker has to say. Single finest answer. Single finest answer. Single finest answer. Okay, that's the single finest answer, and to me that sounds like a short ah, yeah, answer. Here's another map, this time of the United States, and um, in the US there is something called the pin-pen merger, or the pen-pin merger. Um, what is that? Well, uh, some people in this area here, they pronounce the words pin and pen exactly the same. So when they're asking for the thing that you can write with, they would ask you, oh, could you give me the pin, please? I'm not just making this up. Let me play you the sound bit here of a speaker who is talking about uh, chickens. Chicken Joe is my cat, one of my cats. He got his name because he likes to sleep in the hen house. When it got cold, we'd go out looking for him. We couldn't find him. We'd go and open up the hen house and there he would be. Out there in the hen house because hens are very warm if you didn't know that. Okay. Um, so this speaker talks about the hen house, yeah, not the hen house, the hen house, and that's because he has the pin pen merger, and I can actually tell you that he lives in the greater Houston area down here. That's the pin pen merger. Okay, there's not only pronunciation variation, there's also lexical variation, people using different words depending on where they live. Here's again a map of the United States, and in the U.S., people have a category label, a word, for the drinks that you see up there. 7-Up, Dr. Pepper, what's that, Miller's Root Beer or something, uh, Pepsi, Coke, the works, yeah? Sugary, carbonated stuff comes in little cans. What do you call that? Well, people in the south, the pinkish area there, they call it Coke. Even if it's Pepsi, even if it's Dr. Pepper, if it's 7-Up, yeah, that's a Coke. People in California, 
and in the northeast, Boston, Philadelphia, um, they call it soda. Yeah, so Seven Up, Coke, all of that is called soda. And then there's people in the north and uh, northwest who call it pop. Okay. Lexical variation in American English. Also some other things going on there, the black stuff. I wonder what those people are saying. Right. Um, let me come to grammar variation. And here's a clip of uh, the grammar sheriff. Um, the real sheriff says, sorry, stranger, but I'm the only sheriff in this here town. And the grammar sheriff says, I know, I'm just a grammar sheriff. And the real sheriff says, that don't seem like no kind of sheriff to me. And then the grammar sheriff shoots the real sheriff because if you mess with grammar, the grammar sheriff will come after you. So be very alarmed. Okay, what the real sheriff does here is something that is called negative concord, negating a sentence in more than one place. Yeah, here you say, that don't seem like no kind of sheriff to me. Double negation. Uh, the grammar sheriff is very opposed to, to that kind of thing. Uh, well, you should maybe tell the grammar sheriff that negative concord is something that's very, very common around uh, varieties of English around the world. So in this map, all the red colored dots that you see are varieties of English that have negative concord as a grammatical rule. Okay, you have to do it. Um, the orange varieties and yellow varieties have it to some extent, and it's only the non-colored varieties that don't have it. Mm, they're not so frequent. They're in the minority. Right, that's negative concord. <clears throat> All right, let me come back to the fundamental idea uh, for this video, namely that sociolinguistics is the study of variation in language. Um, many linguistic structures have variants. These variants can uh, pertain to pronunciation, they can be phonological, so there's a difference between saying car and ka, uh, between tomato and tomato. Uh, there's also morphological differences, uh, you can say something like, I'm not too keen about that, or I ain't too keen about that. You can be prouder or more proud. And even in syntax, there's variation. You can say something like, my brother's car or the car of my brother, or I gave John the book versus I gave the book to John. Language allows you to say the same thing in two or more different ways. That is a fundamental thing. There's variation. And um, it means that quite often you have one linguistic element or one linguistic category that has two or more different realizations. One category, several possible realizations. That is what sociolinguists are interested in. That's what they mean when they're talking about variation in language. And an important concept in this regard is the so-called sociolinguistic variable. Sociolinguistic variable, um, a linguistic unit that can be realized in two or more different ways. Quite often, it's, it's a binary choice. So you have the possibility of doing one thing or another. Yeah, Think of the R in car. You can either pronounce it car or you can leave it out, ka. Um, sometimes there are more var uh, variants, but we'll get to that. Um, there's speaker internal variation, so speakers sometimes produce one variant or another, so you are not strictly at one end of the spectrum, but rather you're probably somewhere in the middle. So quite often you say, I'm not, but on some occasions you say, I ain't. This means that speakers cannot really be divided into discrete categories. You say in this dialect it's like this, in that dialect it's like that, but rather speakers need to be placed somewhere along a continuum and we need to explain why speakers are somewhere on the continuum where they are. So that in a way is the central question of sociolinguistics. How can we explain uh, that a speaker produces one variant rather than another so and so often? There are certain factors that explain language variation. Um, 
And uh, there are two broad types there, namely language internal factors and language external factors. Language internal factors are factors that have to do with the structures and meanings of language itself. So um, coming back to this um, variety, uh, this uh, variable of saying either prouder or more proud, if you have an American speaker, they will probably uh, form the comparative of clever as more clever. Why? Well, because if they say cleverer, that sounds like they had a potato in their mouth. It's awkward for them to produce. And so because of this phonological difficulty, they opt for more clever rather than cleverer. In um, a syntactic variable, so for instance, the choice between the ditransitive construction and the prepositional dative construction. Here, the examples I have, I gave the book to the old man at the counter. That's the prepositional dative construction. <clears throat> we could also choose, I gave the old man at the counter the book. But notice that this sentence is somewhat unwieldy because we have a very long and heavy syntactic constituent in the middle and that is difficult to process, that is difficult to produce. So because of this syntactic characteristic, people tend to opt for the um, prepositional dative here and put the old man at the counter at the end. That's a syntactic explanation. Um, final example here with two uh, English genitives. Um, the cost of living could be also expressed at the living's cost. But really, the second construction here with the genitive S, it's really reserved for uh, animate possessors like John's office or my brother's car. Uh, things that don't live, living, although it sounds like that, it doesn't live, um, there we choose the other construction and that is a semantic explanation. Right, language internal factors that explain variation. Sociolinguists, for the most part, are really interested in language external factors, factors that relate to the social world, uh, the social situation of a speaker in life. So these are factors that are not per se linguistic. They relate to non-linguistic issues. And uh, so they concern, for instance, differences in the speech between young speakers and older speakers. Young speakers use gonna uh, more often than older speakers. So their age is an explanation. Um, gender, that's something that has been studied a whole lot. So female speakers, um, at least for a certain time period in American English, they used hedge uh, statements with tag questions more often than their male counterparts. So things like isn't it, didn't she, and so on and so forth. Um, so their gender is an explanation. Um, geography, yeah, that's a trivial uh, explanation. American speakers say tomato, Brits say tomato. Uh, and then socioeconomic class, that's also one important aspect of uh, variation in language. Um, if you are a British upper class speaker, you're probably not watching this video, but if you are, uh, you're more likely than middle class speakers to pronounce the word very as very, yeah, with a trill. And because I'm doing this awfully, I brought somebody who does it much better. Listen to this. Let me answer that very deeply because I feel very strongly about it. Okay. Um, you may or may not have recognized Maggie Thatcher saying that she's very uh, concerned. Right. So, um, if we observe these differences and if we can relate them to language internal and language external factors, we can say that there are effects of these factors. So, for instance, if uh, the realization of a sociolinguistic variable depends on, um, say, gender, we get a distribution like this one here. So female speakers use something more frequently than male speakers. Yeah? 
So old and young females pattern together, old and young males pattern together. Um, you could also imagine that there's just an effect of age and that gender doesn't play a role. So in this case, uh, young people, both male and female, would use something very often and um, old people would use it less. Okay, So this would be something like gonna, um, that's just an age factor. And uh, this here would be something like tag questions. Okay, so tag questions, both young and old women use more tag questions than men. I mean, these are made up examples, but you get the idea. Effects of these language external factors. Now, um, sometimes, of course, things are more complicated than this. For instance, say that uh, sometimes an explanatory factor has an effect but only in connection with another factor. This is what's called an interaction effect. Um, look at this graph here. We see that uh, in females and males, there's really just one group that does something very often. Yeah? Young females pattern um, as a single group, and uh, males, they're the old and young uh, males are patterning alike, and also the old females they're talking just like the men. Okay, what kind of phenomenon would this be? Well, uh, think of, for instance, um, the use of like, and that was like totally awesome. Yeah, that's something that young uh, females produce much more often than uh, other segments of the population. Um, okay, to, to create some gender justice here. There's also things that just young men say. Um, the counterpart to like would be the nice little word dude. Okay? Dude. You should check that out. So, those are interaction effects um, where an explanatory factor has an effect but only in connection with another factor. So, um, let's look at some real data. Here is data that people recorded of people saying the word hammer and, and other words that start in an H. And um, you see that the data were recorded in two uh, British cities, in uh, Norwich, which is here, and in Bradford, which is up there. <clears throat> and we see that in both communities, the effect is approximately the same. Uh, H dropping. Yeah, pronouncing hammer as ammer, with a glottal stop at the beginning, uh, is much more common in um, lower classes. Okay, So the lower your class, the more likely you are to drop your H's. And um, so in both communities, well, Bradford has a little, uh, <clears throat> a little more H dropping, but the effect is the same in both communities. Upper middle class people don't do that a whole lot. Lower working class people do it the most. Um, okay, I can't possibly finish this video without mentioning Bill LeBov's fourth floor study. Okay, that's a classic. That's something that um, that's something that will be on the exam. I can tell you now. So, um, what did he do? Well, Bill LeBov wondered does the use of post-vocalic R, yeah, the R in, in car and in fourth and in floor, uh, does that correlate with social prestige in New York City? Does it say something about you whether or not you're pronouncing it? And, um, well, it turns out um, it does. How did he find that out? Well, uh, he decided that it would be a good idea to you know, talk to sales assistants in different department stores. And he chose three different types of department store, a fairly cheap chain of department store, S. Klein, uh, a more upscale department store, Macy's, and then a really upmarket department store, Saks. So, um, he went into the department store uh, and looked for an item that was situated on the fourth floor because he wanted to elicit the answer 
fourth floor in response to a question like, where are the ladies' coats? So he would approach an unwitting sales assistant and ask them, excuse me, um, where are the ladies' coats? And the sales assistant would say something like, yeah, on, on the fourth floor. And uh, then Bill Lebov would come back and say, well, excuse me? Uh, he was younger at the time, but he faked being a little hard of hearing. Um, and the sales assistant would repeat, on the fourth floor. And uh, he would say, excuse me? And they would think, they're on the fourth floor. Yeah. So um, what he elicited was this pronunciation of fourth floor, both in a casual way, first response, and in a more careful way in response to the third question. And what he found was that, first of all, there's a difference between the three types of department store. Um, the final R, yeah, it's a, in New York City speech in the 1960s, that is a very posh and um, prestigious thing to have in your pronunciation. <clears throat> you find it less in a cheap department store, you find it quite a lot in the more upscale Macy's department store, and you find it really, really frequently in the upmarket department store. Okay, now what happens um, if you're um, rephrasing your question and asking people to be more careful in how they pronounce something is, well, in the cheap department store you get a slight increase in the middle brow market, you also get a fairly substantial increase and uh, well the upmarket sales assistants they're already very careful in their first response so there is only a small increase um, here I've graphed you these results <clears throat> this would correspond to the interaction effect that we saw just a minute ago with the like uh, that was like totally awesome so get a huge increase in the two lower class department stores and uh, not much of an effect in the high-end department stores. But the main conclusion of the fourth floor study, of course, is that the articulation of post vocalic R in New York City in the 1960s is socially stratified. Whether or not you pronounce this R says something about your social standing. Right. Now, mm, coming to no, from socially prestigious features to socially stigmatized dialect features. Uh, I already talked about double negation, negative concord, grammar sheriff, you know, look out for the grammar sheriff. They didn't do nothing. Um, but other stigmatized dialect features are regularized. Verb forms like we know they were right or so I says to her. Um, past tense as participles, I should have went. Yeah. Um, Subject-verb agreement, uh, as in we was there instead of we were there. Um, sound substitutions like running or they or thing. Yeah? Those are dialect features that stand out, that are easily recognizable as such. And therefore, they lend themselves uh, as useful tools for, for stigmatizing certain segments of the population. Yeah? Right. A question that you might ask yourself is, okay, if this is so bad, if this is so stigmatized, then why do stigmatized varieties and stigmatized features persist? Why do people not just switch to something that is more advantageous and more prestigious in society? Well, in order to answer this question, we need to distinguish between two kinds of being cool, yeah, two kinds of prestige. On the one hand, there's overt prestige, which is associated with standard and socially prestigious varieties. You know, being cool in a job interview, being smart in a job interview. Um, so it's a symbol of status in mainstream society. It's the kind of language that you use in official situations when you want to impress somebody who's socially superior and whatnot. <clears throat> but there's also something called covert prestige, being cool among underdogs. Okay, you don't always want to suck up to the people who are socially mainstream, but rather, quite often, you also want to mark your solidarity with a locally defined group that does not necessarily aspire 
to the American dream or the, the socially top tiers of society. So here, covert prestige is a symbol of social identity. You and I, we belong together. We're the underdogs. We don't have anything to do with the higher-ups, which are corrupted and whatnot. You know? That's the reason that people keep using things like stigmatized dialects to mark solidarity, to mark group coherence with the people in their vicinity. Over prestige, covert prestige. Right, I'd like to come to a close here. Sociolinguistics, that's the study of variation in language, and I hope to have given you a rough idea of what this variation entails. We have variation in pronunciation, in the choice of lexical items, in the choice of grammatical forms. Um, I didn't talk so much about variation in conversational practices, but we might get to that. Uh, an important concept that I introduced is the sociolinguistic variable. Uh, the ability to say the same thing in two or more different ways. And uh, the important conclusion that I would like you to take away from this video is that linguistic variants are not inherently good or bad. Uh, it's just that speakers attach social values to ways of talking, and this attitude is socially constructed. Um, important tools in this regard, overt prestige um, and covert prestige. All right, we'll continue with sociolinguistics next time, and um, I hope you'll watch that video as well.